I'm grateful for the blessings that God's given me. And as we think about church membership, I think we need to be thankful for the blessings of membership, that we have a church family to be part of, to love us, to challenge us, to care for us. It's, um, it's something that we've been talking about for a few weeks now, and as I've said before, it's often neglected because we don't often see the value in it. We don't understand the importance of being part of a church family and why we really need it. And so we let it slip by, and we slip away, and we just stop participating. And as I've spent the last three weeks sort of emphasizing and some, some things we've, we've looked at, we, we looked at the first week the, the biblical foundations for church membership. If anyone tries to argue that it's not in the Bible, that's baloney. It's in the Bible. We just got to look for it and find it. This, the, the second thing we looked at is that not only is it commanded, but there's great blessing and benefit to being part of a church family. Now, that requires us to be part of the church family, to not stand on the fringes, but to get involved so that we can receive the blessings of being part of that body of believers. Now, last week, speaking of believers, we talked about what it is that we believe, the doctrines of the church that we hold to that unify us. Two of the things that we looked at were baptism and Lord's Supper. We celebrated baptism this morning. We're going to celebrate Lord's Supper here in a, in a little bit. These things we've looked at have been, are, are, are essential to understanding why this really matters. It gives purpose and meaning to our gathering. We're not just here to get something. We're here to receive so that we can give, so that we can serve. And in, all, in, in light of all that we've looked at already and, and talked about, and I will just say, Rebecca's in here. I'm making a change to the sermon schedule. I uh, was supposed to start the book of James next week, but I'm going to add one more sermon to this series because I want us to look at some more specific things about membership next week. But for today, what I want us to see is what the mission of our church really is. Like, what are we supposed to be doing? What's the mission of our church in particular as a body of believers? Let me share with you some good news We'll throw a slide up here. We've seen some growth in our church over the past year. From 20, 2022 to 2023, uh, Sunday school was at 298. Worship was at 362. For 2023 to now, we're at 359 in Sunday school. We're at 491 in worship. That's a 20% increase in Sunday school and a 35% increase in worship. That's good. That's really, really good. And I thank the Lord for that. Some of you are coming back. Some of you are here for the first time. And I, I praise God that we're seeing a little bit of growth here at our church. But we also understand that just because you have numbers doesn't necessarily mean you're growing in the way the Bible speaks of growth. The Bible speaks of growth as in maturity, as in growing up in the Lord. And part of that is, is learned and gained when we are regularly part of the church. We get to grow. It's the, it's the water and the sunlight that we need to grow up to be healthy, strong trees, if you will, for the Lord. We want those numbers to increase. But we have to recognize that, that our mission as a church is a collective pursuit. Everyone must be on board. Everyone must be responding like Isaiah responded and say, I, I will go. Send, send me, Lord. Every member has to be committed to that, that great, glorious task, that great mission. And there is some bad news, and I shared this with you last week. We, our, our, our averages are up in Sunday school and worship, and we praise God for that. But it's also true that we have some 1,600 members of our church who are deemed inactive. That means they're just not here. Now, when I read the Bible and I see membership there, I don't think there's a biblical category or concept for inactive membership. The word the Bible uses is unfaithful. Not inactive, unfaithful. And that's a much heavier word, isn't it? To neglect the bride of Christ is unfaithfulness. And I've, like, I've argued, I will continue to argue that church membership is good for us. We are blessed by it and... As it pertains to our mission, we get to bless others in it. We get to be servants in the way that God has designed for us. I mentioned to you in the very first sermon in this series 
that everybody wants to belong. You want to belong to a group of people, a family, an organization, a team, whatever it is. You want to feel like you belong. There's no better place to belong than in a church when everyone is working toward the same goal for the same purposes. The glory of God as we are making disciples of one another. I'll share with you our mission many times. I'm going to share with you, share with you again today. Our mission statement is very simple. We are helping people walk faithfully with Jesus from generation to generation. You might get tired of me saying this, but I'm not going to stop talking about it because we have to keep this in front of us always. We're here to help others, each other and those that are not part of our church, to walk faithfully with Jesus from generation to generation, which includes the babies to the most seniorest of adults, all right? Everyone's involved in this. Everyone is part of the mission. It matters. And we need you members to be part of this, committed to this Mission. Now, let me share with you from the Word of God today why it matters so much. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians 4, a passage I have referenced and read a couple of times. I'm going to spend some more time on it this morning. And I think all of this has to do with being part of a church family. Let's start in verse 11 of Ephesians 4. And he, meaning God, gave some as apostles... And some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body is being fitted and held together By what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causing the growth of the body for the building up up of itself in love. Now, I believe this passage, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church. He's writing to the Ephesian church, but this letter is intended for all the churches and how the churches are to be functioning, and the purpose and meaning behind what we are doing. And ultimately, we are to be equipping and being equipped for the work of ministry, for the mission, the gospel mission that God has saved us for. A few things I want to bring out of this passage for us today. The first thing is that God has has organized, he's structured his church for its members to grow up in the Christian faith, to grow up. Growing up indicates increasing in some way, a depth, a, a, a maturity that comes with time and effort and a lot of hard work and a lot of encouragement and a lot of challenge, a lot of faithfulness. Now, he says here that God gave some people to the church to help equip you for that. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and as pastors and teachers. These are leaders in the church, particularly pastors and teachers, who are here to consistently and regularly be training the church in the word of God and the truth of God so that you can live by that as you go out about your life. We are submitting ourselves to the instruction of the word from someone that spends time in it and is thinking about how to communicate it so that we can grow. To say that you don't need a teacher is to say that you know everything already. That's arrogance, that's not humility. I don't need someone telling me how to live. Okay, but as I said, asked you before, does God have a right to tell you how to live? Yes. So a pastor, a teacher is here to remind you of that, to lay that before you, to expose or exposit the word of God so that you can know what God has said, what God expects, what God promises, what God warns, what God commands, and then go live by it in faithfulness to him. If you don't know it, you will be ignorant. And if you are ignorant, you are a dangerous person because you will not be living by by the standards of Christ, calling yourself a Christian. 
So the only way that we can get ourselves lined up in the truth is we, if we are under the truth and exposing ourselves to it over and over and over again and then committing ourselves to living by it. And there's really one question you have to ask yourself. I'm going to ask you now, and I'm going to ask you at the end of the sermon. What do you really want for yourself, for your family, for your church, for your community? What do you really want? And deep down in your heart, when it comes to matters of faith, what do you really want? Because whatever that, that is, that's what's going to motivate you. If you want to grow in Christ, then you should be motivated to be in his church. If you don't want to be in his church, then what's your, what's your true motivation? What's going on in your heart? That's a question you must answer. You want to be growing or you want to be stagnant? That's, that's really what we have to figure out. See, membership requires humility so that we're able to be equipped to serve. We're self-sacrificing so that we are able to be serving others in the way that Christ has Commanded, equips you, as it says here, for the work of the ministry, of service. For the equipping, verse 12, of the saints, and it implies Christians, for the work of service. You know, some people just don't want to serve. They don't, they don't want to help other people. They don't care about other people. So they're not going to then submit themselves to teaching that commands that. So you just kind of push away from the church and push away from the church because I don't really want to serve people. That's not of Jesus. Christ expects us, he died for us, to be serving one another. In fact, that's a large portion of what discipleship is all about. It's about serving other people. You've heard me say this. If we come here to worship only looking out for ourselves, and not someone else, we're all going to leave a little frustrated and disappointed. But if we all show up looking to serve others, then everyone gets served in some way. Someone's blessed by your presence because you help them. A handshake, a hug, a kind word, an encouragement, whatever it may be. Maybe just them seeing you singing a song, and they're like, man, that guy, that lady loves the Lord. And then they're encouraged by that. We are serving each other. When we come to worship, when, we come, when, when, when the church gathers, it's for the equipping of the work of service and the building up of the body. Now notice these things are, are sort of connected, right? The building up of the body, I believe, is dependent upon the equipping for the work of service and ministry. If we're not being equipped to serve the Lord, then we're not going to be working to build up the body. And the building up there, I don't believe, is for numbers. It means more people. It means for the health and the faithfulness of the people that are already part of the church. I believe as we grow healthy, if you, again, you want to picture it like a big tree casting a lot of shade. If that church is healthy, more people are going to want to come sit under the shade of God's peace and love. So the healthier we grow as persons and as a church is going to invite more people to come and rest in the Lord and find peace in the Lord. But if we're not being equipped to do that, then our tree's going to shrivel up. No one's going to want anything to do with us because we don't look like Jesus. We look like the world. And we can't call ourselves a church anymore. We must be equipped. and You must submit yourself and expect to be equipped for the work of ministry. Philippians 2, 3 and 4, a passage many are familiar with. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. What's the result? The product is the body of Christ is built up. People are helped. This is our mission this is what every Christian has been called to do in the context of their local church. So are you on mission for the Lord? Are you following Jesus in these things? Are you being equipped to serve the Lord in the ways that he commands? You and I don't get to make this up as we go. The God, God's word is clear. And let me just say this. This one's free. It's not in the notes. This is free, all right? If you don't want to be equipped to serve the Lord, what kind of faith do you really have? If you don't want what Jesus wants for you, 
then you don't want the best thing for your life. You want something secondary. And it's only going to lead you to more misery and more frustration. I'm not saying that following Christ and committing to the church is going to fix all your problems. But it will give you hope in the midst of them. It will give you people to walk with you through them. That's the beauty of this. So if you don't want what Jesus wants for you, then you don't want something better for your life. I would challenge you today, if this is something you've neglected, ask yourself, what do I really, really want in this life? And the second thing we see here is that membership in the church is an ongoing, active pursuit. It's not a one-time deal where you just show up, you get blessed, and you're, you're set for life. It's an ongoing, regular pursuit. One of the best feelings in the world, and if you've ever taken a trip, is arriving at your destination. Especially if it's a long trip, a long car ride, a long plane flight. I was on a plane for 16 hours one time to India. All right? I don't mind flying, but 16 hours is a long time. Right? And when you land and you get off the plane, or if you're in a long car ride, and you finally get out the car, and everything's creaking and cracking, and your back's hurting, and everything's bad, you just, you're like, I'm, I'm here. And it's especially good when you finally get to where you really wanted to go. I heard a guy, a, a fellow pastor say once, they took a 10-day trip to Disney World or something, he said the best ride on the whole trip was the one that went back up my driveway. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best ride. Sometimes it's just, it's just getting to where you want to be. It's a beautiful destination. Now, here's the problem. When it comes to the Christian life, that destination is, is heaven, all right? But it's a long way to get there, and we know that. And rather than being frustrated that we're not where we're supposed to be yet, we need to see it this way. God has you right where you're supposed to be right now. So be growing as you are, as you can right now, and as you get closer to the destination, you will see maturity in your life. You will be a blessing to other people. God does not want us so focused on getting to heaven that we're no use to, to him on, in this life. He wants you to be useful to him now. Heaven will come. It's promised. It's guaranteed. It's sealed by the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's coming. It's going to happen. So don't fret yourself and worry yourself over that. Come and be equipped to be effective today so you can bring more people with you. You can fill the, the, the bus up with more people as you're walking with the Lord or driving down the road serving the Lord. That's the goal here for all of us. So notice, notice what, what, what Paul says here. So we're being equipped for the building of the body of Christ until, he says, we all attain, until we all attain. Until indicating there's a, a period of time that has to pass. It's an ongoing process. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. This really is the question. Do I want to be like Jesus? Do I want my words and my thoughts and my actions to reflect Jesus. If the answer is yes, then we have to be equipping and building up the body until we get there, until we see this unity of the faith working together to bless each other and bless our world. This is the way this has always been designed to work. This is what God wants for us. It's so easy, though, for us to get distracted with other things. This is why the mission is laid before us in this way, helping people walk faithfully with Jesus from generation to generation. We are to be seeking this unity of the faith. And if you look at these, these four products of the equipping, unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, maturity, and to, to the measure of the stature of Christ, you should be wanting to grow up in your faith, unified with, with one another, Knowing more of the Lord, knowledge of the truth is how we're going to grow. It's the fertilizer for our growth. And until we look and act and think and sound more like Jesus. Until we have the fragrance of Christ in our lives. Sadly, there's a lot of people who sit in churches from time to time, and they're just stinky. Now, I'm not talking about their, their body odor. I'm talking about their spiritual odor. They're stinky. They're smelly. 
The Christian church is supposed to be a fragrant place. We ought to be emanating Christ-likeness in everything that we do and say and think and feel. How we interact and involve ourselves in other people's lives is to be reflecting Jesus in some way. We don't need more stinky Christians. We need Christians that want to reflect Jesus. And so committing to God's plan for your life in the church is how we get there. You find me a mature believer and I'll show you someone that's involved in a local church that is submitting themselves to the equipping of the word in their lives so they can be effective for Jesus Christ. Every time you find me someone faithful, I'll show you someone faithful to God's church. We must be seeking this in our personal lives and in our corporate life. And next week I'm going to talk about Bible study and prayer and giving, all those things that we practice in the church, because they're essential to, to, to this happening. But just for the challenge today, you need to understand this is a pursuit you must commit to. It's not passive, it's active. No one stumbles into holiness. Let me say that again for the folks in the back. No one stumbles into holiness. You must get there because you're trying. God is the one who's sanctifying you by his spirit and his word, no doubt. But you are cooperating with what God is doing in your life so you can be most effective for him. So when the call comes, who will go for us? You say, I will go, send me. And third, faithful membership encourages confident faith. If our mission is to help others walk faithfully with Jesus then we must be confident, or shouldn't we be confident in what we say and what we do? Shouldn't we exude this kind of, reflect this kind of confidence, not in ourselves, but in the Lord that we serve? If we're going to help people walk this way, we must be confident in the way that we're walking. The Christian faith is a confident belief that we serve a powerful God, a God who reigns on high, who works deeply, and his people to make us most effective for his glory. God is doing something. Are we cooperating? Are we participating with what he is doing? We must be confident in that. The last thing we need are Christians who are wavering in their commitment. The church needs people that are confident and committed to the truth. So as we are being equipped, we're becoming more confident. I can illustrate it this way. I coach basketball. A jump shot is an art. You have to practice it a lot to get good at it. And the further you are away from the goal, the more training and the more equipping you need. You don't just walk onto the court and become an effective sh shooter or scorer. You have to work and work and work and work. And the more you do it, the more confident you are in your ability to do it. And then you can go out there and be effective with the team. The concept works the same way in the Christian life. If you want to be effective, you have to be trained. You have to be equipped to do this. And as you are equipped, you become more confident in your faith in the Lord. Again, it's not you. You're not confident in yourself. Look at me. Look at what I can do. No, no, no. Look at what God has done. Look at what God is doing. Look at what God will do. He gets the glory. We get the joy of serving him. This is what the equipping is for. Notice what Paul says in verse 14. As a result, as a result here is a reference to all these things he's mentioned before, the training and the equipping and the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. All these things that he said before has a result. And look what the result is. We are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You are no longer tossed around like a little child, like a, like a little boat that's just getting tossed on the waters. No, you are to be anchored to Jesus. We're anchored to the word of God. And we dock our boats in the, in the pier at the, of, the, of the church, if you will. Take that, an, an, that analogy a little further. We were gonna be equipped to get out onto the ocean, onto the seas, and be effective in our destination. If we don't know where we're going or what we're doing, we're going to get tossed around. 
But if we're definite in our destination, our mission, we can set our sails in the right way and get to where God wants us to go. All this wicked wokeness of our culture is just rebranded worldliness. It may seem new to us and all that we're hearing out there in the world and seeing. It's just, it's just evil rebranded. It's a different name. It's the same garbage that we've seen from generations before. New, new expressions of it, new creative ways to be wicked and sinful, but it's all coming from Satan. The truth gets twisted. The lies are propagated and everybody ends up confused. Whenever we believe the lies... It's because, one, we weren't discerning of the truth and the lies. We didn't know what was what. And secondly, we get trapped in it because we think it's a good idea. Oh, this sounds good. This sounds pleasurable. This, sounds, this will benefit me in some way. And we fall for the trap. Look at, look at what Paul says again. We get tossed by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Every wind of doctrine. There's this image of this swirling wind all around us. And your little boat's out there with your sail up. It's just tossing you everywhere. The idea is to be able to learn how to sail your boat. So you know how to use the wind to your advantage. You have the right wind taking you in the right places. Listen, doctrine is everywhere. Doctrine is not just in the church. It's everywhere. It's what we believe. It's really what we believe that fuels what we do. Last week, we talked about the doctrine of our church and what we will believe so that we can be effective in our faith. There's other doctrine out there. And the winds are blowing all these different directions. If you don't know which ones to follow, you're going to end up in the wrong place. You're going to bring brokenness to your life and to your family if you're not careful. The winds of doctrine are swirling all around. It's very easy to do what's convenient What's with the, kind of the, the, the path of least resistance, if you will. To do what the culture says so they'll like you and love you and accept you. But what does Jesus say? If you follow me, the world's going to hate you. Now, again, I'm not propagating that we go out there and pick fights and look for hate. It's going to come to you. If you're faithful to Jesus and you live that way long enough, it's going to come to you one way or another. In your family, in your workplace, in your school, in your neighborhood, it's going to come to you. The equipping prepares you for that. He says that we are facing the trickery of men. Satan uses tricks to lead you astray because he deals in lies. But he deals in subtle lies, doesn't he? It's not these outright blatantly hard or, or evil things. It's subtle stuff that gets you led astray. One of them would be, do you really need to go to church today? You're pretty good. You had a good week. Eh, stay home. It's no big deal. And then next week, what do you hear? Uh, what's two weeks? No, not a big deal. You'll be okay. And then it's two months, and then it's two years, and then it's two decades. You're fine just the way you are. You don't need Jesus and not all that equipping the pastor yelling at you about. You don't need all that. You're good just the way you are. Trickery. Lies, subtle, deceptive, and powerful. If we think they're not powerful, we're going to fall to them. The craftiness in deceitful scheming, Paul says. What's a scheme? A scheme is a plan that has a a desired result. A scheme could be a good thing. What's the scheme? What's the schematic here, right? Or it could be an evil thing. What's the scheme? What's, what's, what's hoping to happen to get you from faithfulness to unfaithfulness, to, to get you from healthy to broken? That's Satan's goal. That's his desire is to break you, to break your faith, to break your faithfulness. So he's going to scheme to get you there, and he's got his hands in all kinds of places to lead you astray. That's the result. So again, wouldn't it be Correct to say it's a deceitful scheme for Satan to try to convince you that maybe this whole church thing just isn't worth your time? Of course it is. Because he knows if you're not here, you're not being equipped, you're not being trained, you're going to fall for all of his other stuff too. This is serious, folks. This is serious. To neglect your membership 
in the body of Christ is to say, God, thanks. I'm not really interested in your mission. I got my own thing going. What if Isaiah would have said, nah, I don't really feel like it today, Lord. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. His sins are forgiven. And God says, who will go for us? And Isaiah's like, nah, I got other things going on, Lord. You find somebody else. Was that you? Is that your response when God says, who will go for me? Now, let me just address something here. I'm going to come out swinging here, so just buckle up. I hear it. I've been in ministry a long, long time. I hear it. Well, I don't go to that church because of all those hypocrites. Yep, we got them. Every church does. You will not go to a church on this planet where you won't find a couple of people that just aren't doing it the right way. They are taking advantage of God's grace. They're saying they're Christians, but they're really not. And I understand it's frustrating. It's frustrating. But let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever been to a, a, like, a, like a gym where, like, where you go to work out? Is everybody in there in shape? No. You're in there lifting weights, working on those machines, whatever it is. You got a group of people over here that they're just, they're just ripped, they're fit. You just, you're a little jealous, right? They're, they got it. And you got some other people over here that are flabby and jiggling everywhere. <laughs> just trying a little bit. And you're sitting there going, I can't believe those people. Look at the hypocrites. Look at those hypocrites. They're not in shape. They don't know what they're doing. I don't want to be part of this gym anymore. You, you would never do that. Because when you look at those people that are not in shape, you acknowledge the fact they're trying. They're there to get in shape. They're trying to improve themselves a little bit. That's what's really happening for most of the people in here. There are some that are playing games with God. I get it. But if someone tells me everybody over there is a hypocrite, that's baloney. They're not everyone's not a hypocrite. Some of them might be. But some of them are not. They're genuine believers who love the Lord and seek to want to honor him with their lives. Those are the people you learn from. Those are the people you get to be friends with. Those are the people that you want to learn. You watch them, you hear them, you see them. You want to be like them because they're pointing you to Jesus. Using the, the, the hypocrite excuse is a cop-out. It is. It's playing games with God's grace. It's saying, God, thank you for your grace. I don't need your bride. Don't fall for that lie. Amen, don't, fall, fall, don't fall for that lie. Instead of abandoning the church, why don't you come help the church? Instead of walking away, get plugged in and help. Get, make it better. Make it better. This is God's grace. Look, this is God's grace to us. He unders, he knows we struggle. He knows there are some inconsistencies in some of our lives. Absolutely. But that's why the grace of God and the mercy of God are so much bigger than our sin. It covers over all of that stuff. And I'm, as a pastor, I am grateful that the hypocrites are here. Because maybe, just maybe, there's going to be that Sunday where the Spirit just gets them. And they realize what they've done and where they've been and how they've been acting. And they repent and turn to Christ. And the church rejoices. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. Don't fall for that lie that you don't need the church. And anybody's acting like a fool, you come tell me. We'll have a conversation. So remember that question I asked you at the beginning of the service. What do you really want? What do you, as a person, what do you want for your family, your children, your grandchildren? What do you want? If you want the blessings of the Lord... Be part of the church he's designed for that purpose, to bless you. It's going to be hard sometimes. Sometimes we don't all agree. We've got to work through our issues. But we're, we're a family. We're, we're a bunch of people here. We're bringing our opinions and our thoughts, sometimes our sins, into the relationship. We've got to work through that stuff. 
But that's the beauty of the, of, the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it makes us able to work through that stuff because the spirit is working. The truth is laid before us and we know what we're supposed to be doing so we can work through our issues to get to a better place. We have a definite mission. We're going somewhere. So let us commit ourselves to that. Do you want to be part of what God is doing? Do you want to be part of what God is doing and where the church is going? The gospel of Jesus Christ makes this all possible. The gospel that saves us, the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we believe in unifies us, it empowers us, it gives us purpose. The gospel is the, is the gifting of the church as well. How, how God blesses his children with gifts and abilities to serve his body, to serve his church. If you are not part of the church, you're not using what God's given you to bless his people. And everyone has a part. Everyone has a role to play in the life of the church, those gospel gifts and that inspiration, that gospel inspiration that we have, knowing that Christ didn't just save us, but he goes with us. He walks with us. He empowers us day by day to be faithful to him. And he welcomes us back whenever we stumble and fall. He welcomes us back when we just didn't get it right. We had a bad day. And we have to go apologize and seek forgiveness from someone we hurt. This is part of the journey, but it's good because God is good and gracious to his people. So earlier we saw baptism. I said to you last week, baptism is our personal testimony to the people of God and to the world really that Jesus is our Lord and my Lord and your Lord. And as members of this church, we all walk through those waters of baptism and, are be, and become part of the body of Christ. But then we come to the Lord's table here in a moment, where we take of the, of the Lord's Supper. And that is not just a personal testimony, it's a corporate testimony. That everyone who is eating and drinking of this meal is committing themselves to the Lord, or has committed themselves to the Lord, and is renewing their commitment to each other. We're saying, I'm on this path with you, brothers and sisters. Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is your Lord, let's keep doing this together. It's a, it's a testimony of our unity as a church. So as we take of this meal, what we're saying to one another is, I am committed to this mission toward maturity and to the glory of God. Will you go with me? Will you help me? Will you join us on this mission? Let me, let me reiterate for you as we close how to become part of our church. The first thing, as I said before, is you must be a believer in, 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 in Jesus Christ. You must be a Christian. And we're more than happy to talk to you about how you become a believer in Jesus Christ, how you are saved from your sin, forgiven of your sin, and made right with God. You must be baptized as a testimony that you are a Christian. If you're coming from another church, you're welcome to come and, and move your letter, as we say, your membership from that church to this church. We'd love to have you. And then at our next members meeting, where the members gather together, we approve the membership so that everybody knows who, who, who is in, who's part of the family, so we know who to serve and how, and, and how to love one another, how to encourage one another. It's a means of protecting the, the, the church as the members do their part to, to guard itself. And so all these steps are taken to make us a healthy church. So if you're interested in membership here, you're not, maybe not sure, I'll be standing right here in a moment as we sing. I want to visit with you about that. But most importantly, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to follow Jesus in this way. If you've neglected membership here, repent and return to Christ. He will receive you. If you have avoided it for some reason, come back. We love you. We will accept you and we'll put you to work. And if you just don't know Christ, trust him today. He is the best thing that's ever happened to me. The best thing that's ever happened to the believers in this room. And he would be the best thing for you as well. Let's, let's have a word of prayer together. Father. As we come to this time of commitment, there is an invitation to those here today, Lord, to join with Greenwood Springs Baptist Church, Lord. But before we get to that, Father, we have to commit our lives to Jesus Christ first. So God, help us to see and know Jesus. To know that he died on that cross and shed his blood to cover over our sins and transgressions against you. And that by faith in him, we are completely and fully forgiven today and forever. So we can commit to serving him because we know 
that his blood does not go to waste. Those that are covered are secured and sealed. And he walks with us on this journey of faith. God, let us as a church family commit ourselves to growing in maturity, not to stand on the sidelines and become inept, but to be confident in our faith because we're equipped to walk with Christ. God, let us give ourselves to this mission of helping one another and helping others walk with Jesus for the sake of this generation and the next. And may this church, God, be a beacon of light and hope and health in our community for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.